Let's pray. Father, thank you this morning for Isabel. Thank you for her testimony about you and about your greatness and your grace upon her. Pray that your hand would continue to be upon her and bring her to 100% and total health. Pray that you would be with us, Lord, as we have the opportunity to trust you for big things. And as we look to you, Lord, I pray that you might give us strength and wisdom as we open your word. Pray that you might speak to our hearts those things that we need to hear. We submit ourselves, Lord, to you today, knowing that we are in need of cleansing, forgiveness, and grace. We pray that you would do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're continuing on with the book of Mark, and we're going to be in chapter 11. Got a big scary face for you here this morning. Mark ch chapter 11 is... Uh, ending with some questions of authority. How many of you like the, where that work authority? One person. Okay. Authority is one of those things that you tend to appreciate if you have it. It's not when you have to submit to it. You tend to appreciate when you have it, and it's difficult when you have to submit to it. I won't ask for a show of hands, but getting pulled over by the police is an exhibition of authority. And if you run from them, they will find you. <laughs> the thing is, Jesus got questioned about his authority, and they say to him, by what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority to do these things? These are two very excellent questions. And I think um, it deserves us to be thinking about what authority really is. Authority is one of those things we just kind of take for granted. You know, like we have government. We live under a system of government. There's a particular authority in the scripture says that we're to submit ourselves to it. It was written by Paul in the time when the Romans occupied Israel. So you can imagine as difficult as it is falling upon our ears in our era and saying, you know, there are some things about this country I'm not in favor of and I didn't vote for. And yet the people in Rome, I think, had a whole lot more uh, or the people under Roman occupation had a whole lot more to say. So these are going to be authority issues. So previously at Grace, we saw Jesus go into Jerusalem this false coronation, if you will, going in as the offspring of David, the king of the Jews. And he was welcomed with open arms. And people came and put their coats down on the road and they put palm branches down. We call it Palm Sunday when Jesus rode into Jerusalem and was acclaimed and worshiped. It's the only time that Jesus actually accepts worship. And so he lets the people do this, which angered the Pharisees. They didn't want anyone acclaiming Jesus to be the son of God, making him equal with God. And so he rides in on this donkey that's never been ridden. And we talked about that last week. By the way, I made a terrible error. This is April 6th, 32 AD, not 62. It was it's a bad <laughs> finger. But it was all figured out from Artaxerxes Longimanus from the time that he made the announcement to rebuild the temple to the time Jesus came, as Daniel predicted in Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. Jesus rode in on the very day, and he held them accountable to know that day. They said, Hosanna, which is to save now, save we pray. And Jesus came in riding on this little bitty donkey, like David once rode on a donkey, or his son Solomon once rode on a donkey to be inaugurated. Jesus walks into the temple, he looks around, and because it was late, we're told that he didn't do anything. But he took stock of everything happening in that outer court, in the court of the Gentiles. It's the only place the Gentiles had to worship. And they had turned it into a giant flea market, a giant marketplace where people were making exorbitant amounts of money off of poor people. Jesus looked around, and he turned around and left, and he went back to Bethany. But he comes back the next day. The next day when he came back, he overturned the tables of the money changers, and he made a cord of, of a whip out of cords, and he cleansed the temple. 
And he said, this is my father's house, which was supposed to be a house of prayer. And you've turned it into a den of thieves. And we see God's zeal or Jesus's zeal for proper worship and holiness. And he cleans it out. Well, in the midst of going back the next day, Jesus passes this tree. It's a fig tree. It's got leaves on it, but it wasn't time for the figs, the full figs to be in. But they usually develop these little buds, which are edible. And Jesus went up to grab one of those off of this tree. And it looked like all the promise of having fruit. And yet this tree had no fruit. And Jesus curses the tree. The only time Jesus curses, by the way. He curses the tree and says, may no one ever eat fruit from you ever again. And you might think he just needed a Snickers. But it wasn't that at all. The fig tree is an emblem of Israel. It's a picture of what's going to happen in 70 AD when there is no more worship going to happen in Jerusalem. They are no longer going to be God's emblem for doing the things that he has done in the past. And so we looked at that, this prophetic metaphor. So Jesus goes in and cleans out the temple. And guess what? Everyone listens to one man who could have easily been put in handcuffs and taken away because they knew. They knew they were wrong. And so Jesus takes all of the animals and casts them out of this outer court. And now it's a place where the Gentiles can seek God and pray and actually do the things that they came to do. They came together and they began talking about how to kill him. It's always a good religious thing to do on a religious holiday. Let's plot somebody's murder. And yet I'm always astounded that they do such things in the name of religion. Well, we left off last week as they were coming back and going into town. The disciples were with Jesus and they looked at the fig tree that he cursed the day before. And guess what? It's dead from the roots, which doesn't happen overnight, right? And Peter, in one of his duh moments, says... Look, Rabbi, the fig tree which you cursed, it's withered away. It's like, uh, wow. I'm not sure if I was Peter, I'd let that story be told. It's like, you know, you don't have to put that in there. But that's why it's the Bible, because it tells the truth. And it's the truth about who we are, because we're like that. It's like when you pray for something and God answers your prayer. And you go, hey, God answered my prayer. And we're all surprised. I amaze myself sometimes at how surprised I can be that God actually listens. And he does. And I'm grateful for Isabel's uh, testimony today. Wasn't it a blessing? This is a sad reminder that even God has a timetable for us to bear fruit. There was a timetable for Jerusalem. And he wept over them and said, you know, if you had known this your day, but You were unwilling. I wanted to take you like a mother hen takes her chicks under her wings, but you were unwilling. And he weeps over the city as he comes in. And they were held accountable to unknow that day. So we talked about the fruitlessness of Israel and the fruitlessness of the tree and how they're tied together. This week, we're going to talk about authority issues, uh, which nobody seems to enjoy begins in verse 22. So Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done. He will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, Believe that you receive them and you will have them. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him. That your father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your father in heaven forgive your trespasses. So Jesus taking the opportunity as Peter says, hey, look, the tree's dead. And Jesus responds with, 
Have faith in God. That seems like a very strange response to Peter saying, look, the tree you cursed is dead. Have faith in God. Last night I was here and it just haunted me. And I just kept meditating on it and saying, Lord, there's got to be something here. There, what is this that Jesus is doing? He's using this opportunity to say, you see this tree? You see Israel? You know what they missed? Faith. They didn't have faith. They didn't believe. And Jesus taking all of that into consideration is saying, Peter, have faith in God. Because we don't want to be a tree that looks all lush and leafy and have no fruit in our lives, nothing to offer anyone else. We don't want to just look like we're doing well. We want to be tied into the source who's God. And we want to have something to be able to offer the Lord in praise and honor and glory to him and also work in something profitable for the people around us. So he says, have faith in God. These are the things we're going to go over. Having faith in God. He talks about trees and mountains. Doubt in prayer, about answered prayer. And he talks about forgiveness in our prayer. So we're going to pick it up with faith. Just one of the parallel passages here is in Matthew 21 and gives us a little bit more insight. It says, and when the disciples saw it, they marveled saying, how did the fig tree wither away so soon? So we understand that Matthew's having a similar conversation. Peter's the one that actually speaks to Jesus, but Matthew's having a conversation with the guys. So Jesus answered and said to them, assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, it will be done. And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. How many of you believe what the word of God says right there? How many of you have a hard time sometimes believing? what the word of God says right there. It's good. The rest of you don't have any trouble. That's great. <coughs> so Jesus says, you could do exactly what I did to the fig tree. So is he teaching us to curse fig trees? Is that this lesson? I want to show you how to do a curse. This is how you do it. You got to have faith and believe hard and the thing will die. In fact, this is, this is the only real negative thing that Jesus ever does is in his ministry besides overturning the tables. It's interesting. They tend to be tied together in the same time frame. It's the only time you see Jesus destroying and showing judgment. In fact, most of the time he postpones judgment. And he says, I'm not the one who judges you. It's Moses who judges you because he's the guy who brought you the law, right? And when you transgress against the law, you're going to have to stand before Moses. I'm not your judge. I came so that you might be saved, which is an, another reason. Jesus' mission on earth was that we might be saved, but it was through his death, Amen. not through instruction, not through tightening the screws and getting us to be obedient. And so he talks about faith. Have faith in God. So many things hit us, and I don't know about you, but if you're like me, I sometimes forget about God. Do you guys ever forget about God? Like, he's here now. He is here with you now. As Jesus said, the kingdom of God is among you or within you. God is present here and now. I don't always have that sense. Driving down the road, somebody cuts me off and I say, you, you know, God's here. Lord, help them, whatever they're struggling with. I don't know what they're on, but... You better help them. Have faith in God. In Ephesians 2, 8, it says, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. So faith is a gift of God. Would you agree? So how can Jesus tell Peter, have faith in God, if it's a gift? Hmm. I don't think he was saying an incantation, have faith in God. Poof, there it is. I don't think he was doing that. I think he was giving an exclamation. 
you need to do this so that you don't get like this tree and you don't become like Israel in 70 AD. I think it's an admonition. Have faith in God, which means there is something I have to play with doing it, and yet it's a gift from God. If I gave you the gift of a shovel that you never used, that would be silly. Anyway, faith is a gift of God. I, I went way deeper than I need to in here. Yeah. Romans ten seventeen. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So is it a gift or does it grow when I read the word of God? It's both. It's a cooperative stewardship. <coughs> Saving faith cannot come from anyone but God. You can't manufacture it. You can't pump yourself up. You can't get yourself all excited like a cheerleader. Yay, I believe. You can't do that. <laughs> but with information from the word of God and his promises, it encourages my faith and I trust in God. Because faith comes from hearing. And hearing the word of God. People, if you feel like you're low on faith, read the word of God because your faith will grow. Why do I say that? Because the scripture says that faith comes. You see, new information, new perspective, inspiration through the Holy Spirit increases our faith and it grows. You know, there are people whose faith don't grow. I imagine it's the people that don't read the word. It's one of the great benefits of being here. Because I'm going to force feed you something that you didn't even plan on hearing. <laughs> John 8, 31 and 32. So Jesus said to the Jews who have believed him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You understand the truth will set you free, but you got to do what Jesus told you to do. Well, the truth will set you free. Not all truth sets you free. And just because you know something doesn't set you free. It happens when you do the things that Jesus told you to do. Then the truth sets you free, right? When you do what Jesus told you to do, you're going to experience that. If you don't do what Jesus said, then you're not going to be free. I don't think that's too far an extrapolation of the scripture. Jesus tells me I should consider other people more important than myself. I'm going to be free to serve if I'm obedient to do that. And if I decide I'm going to get selfish, I'm going to be all bound up in myself. You see how that works? It's those who believed in him, believed in him already, he said. You do the truth and the truth will set you free. That's probably a better rendering. So... We can't wait for God to bring us faith. We've got to step out in faith. And if you don't use even that what you have, even that what you have will be taken away from you. So faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God, and we then are assured of these things as we do them. The Christian life is one of those things where it's taste and see that God is good. It is an experience. It is something where you taste you can't explain vanilla ice cream to somebody. It's kind of creamy and delicious and cold, but nice. And like, how do you describe vanilla? It tastes like it smells. Yeah, but it, how do you explain a taste? You have to taste it. And it's the same thing with Jesus Christ. If you know Jesus Christ, you taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen. You have to taste. You've got to take a big bite and a swallow, and then you can enjoy it. It's not by looking at it and knowing about it. Jesus says, For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things that he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. In another place, Jesus talks about you can tell this tree to be ripped up out of the ground and thrown in the ocean, or you can take the mountain and tell the mountain to be thrown. By the way, do you know historically, no one has ever taken a tree, ripped it out, and thrown it in the ocean by faith. So is this something Jesus is saying, you know, 
It'd be good if somebody would do this. <laughs> or has anyone ever taken a mountain? I mean, I've thrown rocks into a pond, but a mountain and thrown it into the sea? You notice everything gets dumped in the sea, including plastics, which is terrible. <laughs> take a mountain and throw it in the sea. This is a Jewish saying. To take a mountain is that which is... Uh, unassailable, that which you cannot go over, that which is a, an impediment from you getting from A to B. You see, it's something that is solid. It was there before you. It probably will be there after you. But in faith, you can speak to that mountain. It'll be gone and thrown in the sea. What is Jesus saying? You got something in your life that's a problem? That's been there since you were a kid? You got something that you struggle with in your soul? Jesus says in faith, you can speak to that thing and it'll be gone. And if you have faith, not in yourself, not in faith, not in your own words, but in God. Have faith in God. It says that will be removed. God, I believe you're going to take this thing out of my life. Because I know it doesn't please you. Wow, that sounds like you're going to Las Vegas and putting a lot of money on the line right there. It's a big gamble. That sounds like weak faith to me. <coughs> or what about a tree? Something that maybe wasn't there. Something that began to grow and is now a fixture. Jesus is saying whether it's permanent and it's been there for a long time or it's something that grew up in your life, you can speak to that thing and it'll be gone if you believe. And if you have faith in God, because that's what Jesus said. Amen? Amen? So if Jesus says it, I believe it, that settles it. But we have such a hard time doing that, don't we? Because it seems too, like too much. There was a last time that I, there's the last time I did speed, heroin. There was the last time I did hash. There was the last time I did pot. There was the last time I slept with a, a woman I wasn't married to. There was a last time, there was a last time, a last time. I have a whole bunch of last times back behind me. And you know why? Because Jesus gives us freedom. Jesus will set us free. Amen. I'm here to give you a testimony like Isabel. God is faithful. And there are mountains in your life and there are trees growing up in your heart and Jesus wants to remove them. Amen. You got to take a stand and believe. Have faith in God. And Jesus says that we should not doubt Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. <coughs> Doubt is one of those things that creeps in, right? I, I mean, I can believe God for you all day long because I know what the Bible says. And I believe it for every single person I talk to. And they say, you know, Pastor, I'm really struggling with this. You know what? I have faith for you that God can deliver you. Well, what about you? Uh, well, I, you know, I'm a different case. Why am I a different case? I'm a different case because I tend to lack faith that God loves me that much. How about you? I tend to lack the faith that God will do it for me. I believe he'll do it for you because I love you guys. But I'm not a fan of myself because there's still stuff in my heart that I know shouldn't be there. You feel that? Jesus wants to take that. And he wants to strengthen your faith so that you can be an example and a radiant example of who he is. That's our purpose. Amen? Amen. You remember Jesus walking on the water and he walks out to Peter and the boys as they're going across the sea. And they, of course, they hit the panic button because there's a ghost and he's headed right for us. They thought he was a ghost. It was Jesus. And he said, peace, take it easy. Calm down. It's me. And Peter because it's always Peter. <laughs> Lord, if it's, if it's really you, command me to come out on the water and I'll walk on the water to you. Peter really put it all on the line, didn't he? It wasn't Jesus's idea, it was his idea. And he says, come. One word, come. Peter steps out of the boat, walks on water and begins walking to Jesus until he looked around. And he said, oh, no, 
This is really happening. I'm really, I'm really walking on water. This, I can't be walking on water. <laughs> when he looked at Jesus, everything was fine. When he believed, everything was fine. When he began to doubt, he sunk. And I love that Jesus comes and pulls him up. And he says, you were doing well. Why did you doubt? And you don't get an answer from Peter. Presumably, he's still choking on water. Why do we doubt? We doubt. God, help us not to doubt. Amen. What could he do if we took him at his word? What could he do to this neighborhood with your friends, with your relatives that don't know him? What could he do if we believed him for the things he said he would do? Believe and not doubt. Have faith in God. But I can't believe it. I know that's what a lot of people, a lot of people would say that, or I can't believe it's not butter. <laughs> there are a lot of things that we don't believe, like all kinds of things. But God's word, we should have a special reverence in our heart that it is the truth. He has shown himself to be faithful over and over and over, and he will continue to do so. If there's anything that you can believe is the truth, it's God's word. Amen? Amen. So let's hold on with both hands, shall we? Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6b says, Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. You see, it's not about pumping yourself up. It's about trusting God. One is trying to manufacture something. The other is releasing something. And it's a very different situation. Matthew 17, 20 says, So Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief, for assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, that's a teeny weeny little crumb, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Jesus said that. The reason that he spoke this word to them is because there was a boy, and he was possessed, and they couldn't cast the demon out. And so Jesus shows up, and he casts the demon out. And they said, how come we couldn't cast the demon out? And he said, because of your unbelief. What could we do if we took God at his word? What would change in our lives? What sort of things lodged in your heart for years, what sort of mountains would be disappeared? What sort of trees would be uprooted? People, I want to encourage you to trust God. You listening? Amen. Good, because I'm preaching to myself. I'm glad somebody's listening. <laughs> And Jesus says, whenever you stand praying, he moves on to the next section. If you have anything against anyone, forgive him. That your father in heaven may also forgive your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your father in heaven forgive your trespasses. How many of you have shivers? <laughs> oh, Lord. You get faces and names and events flooding into your mind of people that have hurt you and, and, you know, just ravaged your life and they don't understand the pain they've caused in your life. It says if you are standing and praying, which by the way, shows that you can stand and pray. You don't always have to be on your face or on your knees or sitting in a chair or, you know, completely laying down on the floor in the snow. You know, it doesn't have to be like that. When you stand praying, he's still talking about faith because faith is always toward God. And you remember that you have somebody who's harmed you and you have unforgiveness in your heart. Forgive them. Now, you might say to me, I can't do that. It's not that easy. You don't understand. It's not like you pull a string and all the balloons fall out of the ceiling. It's not an easy thing to forgive somebody. It's not an easy thing until you decide to do it. 
Because if you want the truth to set you free, you got to do the things Jesus tells you to do. And he says here, if you remember anybody that's not forgiven by you, forgive them. Just do it. It's a Nike commercial. (laughs) Jesus says, just do it. You don't need to learn any more information. You don't need to go to therapy for years. You just need to do it. Because if Christ came and died for your sins, how could you not forgive somebody else of their sins? What right do you have? It's like somebody gave you a billion dollars and you put the check in your pocket and they said, listen, I understand you have four pennies in your pocket. Could you give me those? Oh no, those are mine. (laughs) You got a check for a billion dollars and you're going to hold on to four pennies. Do you understand that's what unforgiveness is? Because Christ has forgiven you of all your sins, past, present, and future. It's a little like cutting off a limb by sitting on the wrong side. (laughs) It's also said that unforgiveness is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. (laughs) Unforgiveness is a killer, people. It separates families. It separates married people. It separates people from church. It separates people. So let me ask you a question. Is God's forgiveness transactional? It says, if you do not forgive others their sin, God will not forgive yours. That sounds like a transaction, doesn't it? I'm trying to stir up trouble here. For those of you deeply theological, saying the pastor is blaspheming God. (laughs) Does it mean that your salvation disappears and goes away? Is he talking about saving faith there? If you're going to be unforgiving towards other people, know that whatever it is that you're involved in and going on in your life, God's going to hold you to it. And if you think you're going to get freedom from it, or you could just ignore it, and it'll go away. It won't. And God takes special interest then in your faults, your shortcomings, your failures. And God's going to say, okay, here we go. Going to work. I don't know about you, but I would rather just do what Jesus said, forgive people. And in fact, I pre-forgive people because that's what Jesus did for me. Do you understand? I'm sure that I'll do wrong from now until the day that I die. And yet Jesus died for all of my sins. He pre forgave me. So you know what? My wife can't ever make me mad if I pre forgive her. (laughs) You can't make me mad if I pre forgive you. I I pre forgive all you all. (laughs) So what are you going to do? What are you going to do to me to mess with my mind? Pastor David, I didn't appreciate what you said and blah, 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 blah. Okay. Praise God. Let me pray with you. God, fix this crooked human being. (laughs) You can do stuff like that if you already have a heart of forgiveness toward people. Now, listen, does it mean that you don't reconcile? No. Does it mean that you don't have conversations about when people do something wrong? No. Does it mean that there's never a time you're going to go to somebody and say, listen, you got to cut that out? No. But you know what? You go, you go ready with a pardon in your pocket. That's what it means. But if they don't repent then you got to hold it a little longer. So God's forgiveness is not transactional. He gave his son, Jesus Christ, that just by the receiving and the asking, we are saved, period. Different than every other religion on the face of the planet, including some that call themselves Christians. It is a free gift and it's there for the asking, but it will cost you your life. We have Jesus as this great example, uh, Ephesians 4.32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ also forgave you. So you should have the same forgiveness that Jesus had. How many of you feeling a little intimidated? I feel like Jesus's forgiveness is huge and mine is not so huge. 
So if you're praying and you remember that you have something against somebody, forgive them. Forgive them. There's this judgment. It says in 1 John 4, 20, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he's not seen? Amen. And this commandment we have from him that he who loves God must love his brother also. You can't say I love God and hate someone who is made in his image, who you can see and touch and feel. You can't say I love God when you hate somebody that's made in his image. You can't do it. If you say you love God and you hate somebody, you're a liar. The Bible said that. You can get mad at me, but the Bible said that. So don't lie. In Psalm 32, David talking about not forgiving and not accepting God's forgiveness and staying in sin. He says, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity or hold stuff against you. And in whose spirit there is no deceit. In other words, you don't have a little secret that, you know, nobody knows and you hope they don't find out. When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. Selah. I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. You see, David explaining what it's like to hold on to that. Either you're not accepting the forgiveness of God and you beat yourself up, or you're holding on to a sin in your life because you don't trust God and giving it away. You don't think he's got a better plan for your life. And so you hold on to it with a death grip and it kills you. Your bones will rot away on the inside of you every day like it did with David. You will find your vitality going away and you will be tired and worn and sleepless nights and all of those things come with somebody that's holding on to sin in their life. Can I get an amen? amen? So you know what it's like. Why would you choose to live that way? And sometimes we do. God help us not to live that way. It says in Proverbs 15, 17, better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a stalled ox and hated, hatred within. So what, what does that mean? It's better to eat a plate of grass, having peace with God, than it is to have the finest steak that was raised, an ox that was raised in a stall that produced the most sumptuous meat. It's better to eat a plate of grass, being right with God, than it is to have a sumptuous steak. You know, there are people all over this country that have big, enormous homes. They have giant swimming pools. They have jacuzzis. There are people that have bowling alleys in their home. There are people that are rich and wealthy, out of their mind, their garage can't be any bigger, and so they have a warehouse full of cars and they're miserable. Their families are fractured. They have no idea who their friends are, and they're miserable. You know, you see a lifestyle like that and you go, oh, they must be thrilled, they must be happy. They must, everything must be going well for them. No, because the stuff does not do it. It's about having peace with God. Have faith in God. And then as Jesus going through his ministry in verse 27, they came again to Jerusalem. And as he was walking into the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him and they said to him, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority to do these things? Well, that's a good question. Remember the day previous, he went in and cleared the temple out. They were pretty hurting in the pocketbook because they were making a profit off all that mess. Like, who do you think you are? We would say in Jersey. Who do you? We would say it with a head thing. <laughs> who do you think? What authority? And it got me thinking, 
What constitutes authority? I think it's important to think about because we have terms that we use all the time that we don't understand. We know that a badge carries authority, right? That's why you pull over when the lights are flashing behind you. You don't pull over when the lights are flashing behind you? <laughs> People. A diploma. You know, you go to a doctor and you, you see like a wall full of diplomas. You go, oh, I picked a good doctor. How smart am I? Or how many likes you have on Facebook. Does that give you authority? It, I mean, they call you an influencer. It's got to be that you have authority. Your income, because you're at the upper echelon of what people make. Or your popularity. I have so many friends on Facebook. I have 20,000 friends on Facebook. Oh, yeah? Can you tell me all their favorite color? No, not even something like that. Okay. That is not authority. Self-confidence does not mean you have authority. Because there are a lot of people, you can get a two-year-old who's very bossy. It doesn't mean they have authority. What about having a strong opinion? Sometimes those people rise to places of authority because they have strong opinions. But it doesn't mean they have authority. What about persuasiveness? The ability to change people's hearts and minds, to be an eloquent speaker. Would that mean that you have authority? No, that is not authority. The power to give orders and make decisions, the power or right to direct or control someone or something, the right and ability to enforce and set a standard. That's what authority is. Authority is you can set up the standard and enforce it. So when you tell your kid, when you tell your kid things that you can't enforce, don't do that anymore. Because if you can't enforce it, the kid's going to learn to just be disobedient. If you're going to set a standard, you better be able to hold it. And if you say something like, don't touch that, and they're touching, 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 don't touch that. Touching, 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 touching. Don't touch that. You know you're undermining your own authority? You show you have no authority. And then you're raising a criminal. Because that's where they'll be. That's what authority is. And so they're asking, by what authority do you do these things, Jesus? And who gave you this authority? Here's kind of a world business model of what authority looks like. Somebody is responsible, successful, strong, powerful. They have character. They're a leader. All of these things don't constitute authority. It's the, it's the ability to set a standard and enforce it. John 5, 19, Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the son can do nothing by himself but what he sees the father do. For wherever, whatever he does, the son also does in like manner. Jesus had authority because he was under authority. You have no authority unless you're under authority. It's an interesting thing. If you have authority, it's because it's been given to you by somebody else who's higher up the food chain. You understand? That's what authority is. It's not because you decide that you're going to take charge. It's not because you have strong opinions. It's not because you know better than someone else. Try to tell your boss that. Good luck to you. Jesus says, authority is because I listen to my father. John 8, 28 says, and Jesus said to them, when you lift up the son of man, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing of myself, but as the father taught me, I speak these things. Jesus had authority from the father. He had it because it was given. It wasn't taken. John 5, 30, I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. Jesus says it again and again. He says it in more times, but we're running out of time. Jesus said it many times. I am under authority. There was a centurion that understood that. And he came and he says, I want you to heal my servant. My servant's home sick. And he goes, okay, let's go. And he goes, no, no, no. I'm not worthy to have you under my roof. I am a man under authority. So just speak the word and he'll be healed. And Jesus said, I haven't seen such faith like this in all of Israel. 
Eat according to your faith. It's done. And he went home and somebody met him on the way back and said, hey, the servant's healed. And he goes, what time was it? And he found out it was about one o'clock. That's exactly when he spoke to Jesus. So Jesus made it happen because he always does. I can of myself do nothing. Jesus was under authority. It's not a badge, a diploma, how many likes you have. It's none of those things. It's about accountability. You know, don't you think that would be wonderful in perhaps Congress today? <laughs> Equal accountability for everyone. Not, oh, you got caught with drugs and firearms. It's okay. It's not a problem. But you, you, we're going to string you up, and it's going to cost you millions of dollars to defend yourself. We all see it, the political landscape. There's no accountability. For those in power, there's no accountability. And you know what happens? They undermine their own authority. Why is the whole world falling apart? Why are people walking into stores just taking what they want and leaving and nobody stops them? I better not see it happen. Sorry, I went on a rant. <laughs> But Jesus answered and said to them, after being asked about his authority and who gave him this authority, and Jesus answered and said to them, I also will ask you one question, then answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? Answer me. Answer me. Jesus is pushing them. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, if we say from heaven, then he'll say, well, why did you not believe him? But if we say it was from men, they feared the people, and they all counted John to have been a prophet indeed. So they answered and said to Jesus, we don't know. <laughs> and Jesus answered and said to them, then neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. <laughs> so was Jesus tricking them? It's my fault. I didn't say, make sure you have your cell phone shut off. <laughs> Jesus says, I'll ask you a question, and then you answer me. Is this Jesus teaching a master class on how not to answer a question? <laughs> I've got a question for you. Okay, I've got a question for you. You answer this one. Is that what it was? Jesus didn't want to answer their questions? That, that sounds like the Savior I know. He never wants to inform anybody of anything. You have to understand the question, the nature of the question, the motive underneath the question, and the people asking the question. So you have a whole lot of stuff you have to assess when somebody asks you a question. In Luke twenty two sixty seven, Jesus was put to the test. If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, if I tell you, you will by no means believe. Jesus knew if I told you the truth, you wouldn't believe it. And so he didn't tell them. Because they were just looking for a reason to go, aha, and put him to death. And Jesus knew. John 10, 24 to 25, and the Jews surrounded him and said to him, how long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my father's name, they bear witness of me. In other words, I told you, you don't believe. I'm doing all kinds of miracles and you don't believe. You're going to ask me again, and I'm going to tell you again? Guess what? You already have your mind made up. There are some people you don't give an answer to because they already have their mind made up. So Jesus says, I'll ask you a question. What about John? What do you do with his baptism? Was it from heaven or was it from men? And he says, basically, my authority comes from the same place. That's why baptism is one of those things we do here at the church, because we believe it's not of man, that it's of God. And so those are the authority issues in Mark chapter 11 next week. We're going to get into chapter 12 with some more authority questions. And they're going to be asking Jesus more difficult questions. As he gets closer and closer to the end of this holy week, it's going to be more and more stringent. They're going to ask some interesting questions about paying taxes. So we'll talk about that and uh, some other things. So. 